Hi, my name is Sheila. Well, we had a tragedy this week, recently, Monday night, Buffalo Bills safety, DeMar Hamlin was hit and injured on the field. And before I get started talking about, is it time to say goodbye to football? What do we think about other sports and injuries? And, you know, the talk used to mostly surround concussions. Before we go there, before we go there, let's just be, you know, really mindful of the Hamlin family and take a moment to have some prayers for them. Yeah. What do we say? What do we think here? You know, this is a this is a lot. A lot of people watched this happen right in front of their eyes. Hard to take, hard to watch, hard to even think about now, even after the fact, two days later. Uh, let's just sort of go back um, for a minute and sort of talk about just sports injuries in general, because these will always pop up like it becomes the trending subject when something like this happens. And there's always a lot of talk around the sports that have, well, we'll call them, you know, contact sports, full body contact sports, sports where you're likely to take a hit and really suffer a traumatic injury that won't just leave you with a broken bone, but could take away your life. So, you know, every time there's one of these types of injuries, the questions come back, you know, is football too violent of a sport to even play? And it's not just football, because then we open up the space to, well, what about hockey? What about baseball? What about soccer? You know, any sport where you have players potentially running into each other or intentionally engaging in physical one-on-one -on -one contact or multiple parties, you know, involved. And then there's always this possibility that there's going to be a lot of bodily harm. You know, one of the things I went back to take a look at was some of the information around just injury rates with sports. And you know this, if you have ever taken, you know, taken your kids or family members or friends, you've ever gone to an ice skating rink or engaged in even maybe a yoga um, session, a lot of times they will make you sign a release form just to engage in the class or just to come inside their recreational facility. Now you have to, they'll say, oh, you have to go online first and you have to fill out the release and sign and date that electronically. And then when you show up, you can participate or they will have it on site. And it's not even just recreational centers themselves. It may be organizations now. Think scouts or, or, you know, school organizations where they constantly have these releases now because they want you to know you might be engaging in an activity that won't just injure you, but it's something that could possibly end your life. Back over here at John Hopkins, I actually have a website and I really should pull it up here so you can look at it, but I just want to talk about it because I want to uh, talk about a few things. And it says, how frequently do sports injuries occur? You know, because we get injured all the time doing things, car accidents, falling down the stairs at home, slipping on ice when we're out shopping after a major storm. So injuries happen all the time. Sometimes they are our fault. Sometimes they are another party's fault. So like the ice, for instance, if they didn't clear the sidewalk and yet they said, hey, come, we're open, shop, and yet they didn't clear the sidewalk. Well, that might be a problem. Um, it says in the U.S., about 30 million children and teens participate in some type of organized sports and more than 3.5 million injuries each year happen. And almost one third of all injuries that occur in childhood are sports related injuries. Now, so we're just talking about young people here, children, teenagers who are engaging in sporting activities. Here's the thing. We want our kids to go out and have fun and engage in activities. My daughter 
ran cross country for a little while. She did cheerleading. Think about that cheerleading tossed up in the air. Thankfully, she was base. So she was lifting up other people. But all of these activities that we say we want our kids to be a part of, grow, have fun, just like we did growing up. And so we're trying to balance safety against participation and then worried about legal liability if you're the one who is providing the opportunity for these kids. So it's not just, you know, it's not just something we think about um, for just these teams out here, but it's also something that we think about um, with children. It says here, although death from a sports injury is rare, rare the leading cause of death from a sports related injury is a brain injury. Now in Demar Hamlin's case, you know, you had a hit and we've, and you've heard about these hits in the news before somebody gets hit. It's that sudden hit to the chest that results in cardiac arrest. And, you know, they've talked about this more in baseball where you're hit with a baseball, you know, in football, we've tended to think more about concussions and head injury. And that's what this is talking about here. You know, um, although death from a sports injury is rare, the leading cause of death from a sports related injury is a brain injury. Sports and recreational activities contribute approximately 21% of all traumatic brain injuries in American children. So yeah, so I want to go down the list. Here's here's a list of some of the ones that they talk about. They talk about basketball, um, and you can kind of see that because you're like running really fast. There are players on the court. Everybody's moving around like this. And so I would think that slipping and falling, tripping and falling, that um, you know those would be some of the things that would happen running into each other. You know, um, baseball and softball, it says baseball has the highest fatality rate among sports for children ages five to 14 with three to four children dying from baseball injuries each year. Again, that's a low number unless it's your child. Bicycling. Oh, my gosh. Remember, now we have, you know, helmet safety laws for kids under a certain age. You have to have on a helmet. And this has helped bring down the number of brain related injuries in children. So this has been a plus it's one of those ways to take policy and sort of help make our lives better. Right. And we've seen that with um, football, too, in terms of changes in helmets. Right. Um, this is football, almost 215,000 children ages five to 14 um, treated in the emergency room for football related injuries. And you've got ice hockey. You've got inline roller skating skateboarding, sledding, snow skiing, soccer, trampolines. How many trampolines do you see in people's backyards? And it says about 65,000 children ages 14 and under were treated in hospital emergency rooms for trampoline related injuries. So it's not just football, okay? It's not just football. It's all kinds of sports where there is the opportunity to be injured. And nobody wants to sit in the house and not do anything. And again, outside of sports, you could be doing other things and still get injured. But let's go over and um, see what the Buffalo Bills has been saying about this. Um, I know there's been a little bit on their Twitter page. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, let's see if I can pull that up so we can see what's been going on. They have um, thankfully been sort of sharing some of this uh, to keep people informed. And again, it's really sad, you know, it's it's traumatic to um, hear these things that are going on. And let me unplug my, so maybe I can have a, less a sound back there in the background and making sure we're sort of seeing this here. So yeah, so we've got the Buffalo Bills. This is their Twitter page. Um, and of course, um, They've changed it here to his number and pray for Damar. And he's only 24 years old. And I think about that because that means he's only three years older than my daughter. And it sort of puts it in perspective when you think about, you know, someone that age being hurt. Um, but let's see. So, yeah, I want to go down to um, their latest comments to see what's going on. And a lot of support here, a lot of support. But let's see if we can go down. Okay, so 
Um, the latest thing that they're saying here, um, 19 hours ago, he spent last night in the intensive care unit and remains there today in critical condition. We are grateful. And here's exactly what happened. So let's let's talk about this. Um, it says he suffered a cardiac arrest following a hit in our game versus the Bengals. His heartbeat was restored on the field and he was transferred to the UC Medical Center for further testing and treatment. He is currently sedated and listing, listed in critical condition. So this is the current um, status um, yesterday that came out and then the most recent update, this, this news about his condition. And so, like I said before, you know, you've got now his team rallying around him. You've got, um, you know, everybody else too. There was also just the number of people who have contributed to um, his toys. I think it's, it's over 4 million now or something like that. It says fans give millions to Hamlin's toy drive for kids. And let's make sure I can keep my sound off of there. His goal was simple. And I'm just reading something from ESPN. It says um, he had wanted to raise $2,500 online to buy toys for kids. And it took about two years. And so now, okay, so it's even more. The last time I saw it, um, it was saying that it was at about um, 4 million. It's now being reported that it is a whole lot more than that. So I'm seeing here that it's being reported, um, yeah, to be close to 5.5 million. It says uh, donated it in the first 24 hours after his injury and the number is climbing. And so um, that that's an awesome thing there, but we do pray for his recovery. And um, yeah, so some of his family members have spoken you know, and everybody's praying for his recovery, but is there a way to make these games safer, to make sport safer? Is there a way to do that and still be able to enjoy the sport? Now, over the years, like I said before, you have seen changes, everything from, you know, helmets and gear, how you can contact players, bodily contact is what I'm talking about. And then also making sure that you have sufficient um, medical, um, your doctor on staff. And so, you know, you've got your paramedics there and you also have, you know, your team physician and staff, those people who are making the calls, looking at what's going on and then making a determination about whether or not a player who's been hit can go back out on the field. And what are the signs? And they're going down the checklist to see, you know, is this person in a position where they can go back out on the field or not? Well, you know, in a situation like that where it's football and you've got professional teams and you've got um, professional medical advisors there, that works in that situation because, you know, they've implemented a practice that they can follow. But when you get away from that and you say, okay, well, we're moving to high school and, and colleges, it's like, yeah, we still have some sense of that. But beyond that, when we say, hey, we're going to go to the skating rink as a family or an organization, how many of you actually, you know, look it up and say, okay, so if something happens, we basically know they're going to call 911. But do they have a defibrillator on site? Where is their first aid kit? Does the staff who's there know, you know, where it is, how to locate it and who to bring it to, what to use? And that's sort of, what kind of training do they have? Most of us don't do that kind of analysis when we walk into these places and engage in sporting activities ourselves. Now, like I was saying before, my daughter was, uh, a cheerleader um, at her high school, but she had also engaged in dance and cheer at a younger age. And they had practices a couple of times each week. And it was a huge place. The place was huge. They had tons of teams in their practicing. And it n never really crossed my mind to say, okay, well, where's the first aid kit in here? How far away is 
you know, the nearest hospital because it, where she was practicing wasn't even in the same city where I was. And now that I think about it, you know, we, we were going to be in a different, I know where the hospital is now that I think about it. And it was not close. <laughs> it was not close at all. So if there was um, something that would have happened, you know, it would have taken, I don't know, at least 15 or 20 minutes for the paramedics to arrive if they're coming from the hospital, if they're coming from a fire station, nearby fire station, a lot less time. But a lot of times we don't think through what our own checklist is when we're engaging in some of these activities. You know, so these conversations come back up whether or not some of these games or games or sports that we need to say bye to, or is there a way that we can make them safer? Are people knowingly signing up? You know, a lot of times you're, you know, at that age, you're really young. You know, you just want to play football or you just want to play basketball, just like another person just wants to be a painter or another person wants to be a doctor or a teacher. You know, that's what you want to do. And you're not necessarily every time you know you go to practice thinking about today is the day that i might not come back home you know but a, you know a lot has changed in the world and and you know any kind of occupation has certain risks involved so you know so there's a concern for player safety here as it should be and i guess some of the questions now are going to come back up again you know is there a way that we can make sports safe so let me know your thoughts in the comments. Are there other things that we can do? Are we past the point? You know, do we need to say goodbye to some of these sports? Or is there something we can do to make them better? Again, prayers to the Hamlin family, Buffalo Bills. You guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to um, like the video and subscribe to the channel. Peace.